Our text this morning is from Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the Father of unfailing light. On that first day of creation, you spoke into darkness, and there was light. Into each of our hearts, where there was only darkness, you spoke, and there was light. And as we come now to your word, please speak again and flood our understanding with light. Let your word be a sunrise to us this morning, that we might not just understand it, but also understand ourselves and the world around us, all illuminated by your unfailing light. In your son's name we pray. Amen. God's covenant with Abram, or Abraham, as he'll later be called, or as he's called, renamed in this passage, God's covenant with Abraham unfolds in the course of several episodes over the first half of the book of Genesis. Um, it begins in Genesis chapter 12. He's introduced right at the end of chapter 11, and then the beginning of chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, is where God first makes his covenant with Abraham, makes his promises to Abraham known. Um, God called Abram when he was in the city of Haran. If you read it in, at the end of Genesis 11 and then into Genesis 12, we find out just a little bit of the story, the biography uh, behind Abram or Abraham before he's called. His father, Terah, was from the city of Ur, which was the capital city of the, Cal of the, um, of the nation of, um, sorry, I'm blanking on it. <laughs> Sumer, there we go. It was the capital of the Sumer nation, and it was probably the greatest nation at that time. It was right on the bank of the Euphrates as it en empties into the Persian Gulf. Uh, it would be in modern-day Iraq. Um, so it was this great nation, and it was a very pagan nation. One of the things that they've unearthed um, at Sumer from this time, or at Ur from this time, and this would have been roughly 2000 BC, and one of the things that they unearth is this enormous ziggurat, an ancient um, sort of pyramid with a temple on top for wor worshiping um, pagan deities. And that's where um, Abram was born and raised and brought up. And then Terah, his father, fled from Ur to the city of Haran. And while they were in Haran, then God called Abram and began his covenant with him in, in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Um, and when he called him, actually, I'll just um, read those few verses really briefly. Uh, the Lord says to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make a great nation. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So there he is. He's already left. Um, he's left Ur, and he's in Haran, and God calls him. As far as we can tell, God, um, Abram had not known God before this. Uh, his father had not been serving uh, Yahweh. Uh, if, you, if you hop to Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. It's an interesting little aside that we learn about Abram. Um, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So um, Abraham's father, Terah, served the, the, gods of, um, the gods of Ur. He served other gods, and that's how Abram was raised. And then he's called up out of that. God says to him, get up, leave your family, leave your gods, leave everything you know, come and follow me because I have plans for you. I've got, I'm going to make you great. 
So he, he commands Abram to move forward to a new land in faith, forsaking the life that he once knew, and as a result, God would bless him so that he would become a great nation, a nation that would eventually bless the entire world, a nation that would eventually topple all who stood against it. Um, God repeated and expanded on this promise to Abraham or to Abram several times in the following chapters. So we start, and, and I'm just going to name some chapters here. And if you are um, one of those multitasker um, sermon followers, then you might just kind of flip through and skim these passages as we're working through the sermon, because I, I don't have time to go through all of them here. But he, it begins here in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. If you look, flip over just to Genesis 13, verses 14 through 16, he repeats this promise. And and, and fleshes it out a little bit more to Abram. And then chapter 15, verse 5, he tells him a little bit more about the promise he's giving him. In chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, that's the passage that we just read. Then he goes into quite a lot of detail about this promise. And then again in Genesis 22, verses 17 through 18, he's going to flesh it out even further. So this is one promise that he's slowly expanding to Abram, to Abraham over the course of his life. In Genesis 17, uh, the passage that we just read, as God renewed this covenant with Abram, as he's, as he's uh, going over the details, the promises that he's made with Abram, he gives Abram two signs so that he can know and have confidence in this promise. One is the sign of circumcision. If you look at verses 9 through 27, he's just describing the commandment of circumcision. So he's given him a promise, and then he gives him a sign to go along with the promise that's supposed to be a confirmation to Abram of the, of the promise that God has given him. It's something that sets Israel aside so that everybody knows the Jews, Israel, they're different. And they're set aside by the sign of circumcision, and they're set aside to receive this special promise that Abram or that God has given to them. Um, and, and the circumcision and the covenant that's made with Israel come to be so closely united over the next 2,000 years that by the time of Jesus, when you said the covenant— what you meant was circumcision. If you say keep the covenant, you're talking about circumcision, but circumcision then sort of entailed everything else, all the other promises to Israel. So circumcision becomes this important sign of the promise. But it gives him one other sign, one other clue, to, so he can better understand what the promise that's been given to him is, and that is he changes Abram's name to Abraham. And I keep jumping back and forth between, it's like before Genesis 17, he's Abram, and then after that, he's Abraham. I'm just going to say Abraham from now on, even if I'm referring to Genesis 12. Um, but he, he changes his name from Abram to Abraham in order to mark him out so that people know what has been promised to Abram. Uh, to Abraham. So the, the, at the very beginning, his, his name initially is Abram, and Abram means uh, father is exalted or exalted father. So Av or Ab, V and B in Hebrew are kind of uh, interchangeable. Um, the, so Av or Ab means father, and then Ram means exalted or high or lofty. So father is lofty, father is exalted. And if Abram was named while his father was in Ur, um, the odds are that he's referring to um, a pagan deity of some sort. He's not talking about uh, the one true God. And God is going to change his name because now he's a father of one true God and he's got special promises given to him. Now, if you look in, in Genesis 17, verse, verses 4 and 5, he says um, he's going to change his name to Abraham. And the reason he's changing his name to Abraham is because now you're not going to be an exalted father. Now you're going to be a father of many nations. And that's how it's translated in verse 4 and verse 5. Most of our English translations say, because you're going to be a father of many nations. And that is a, um, that is a faithful uh, translation of the, of the name uh, Abraham. If you look at uh, uh, yeah, Romans 4.17, Paul translates it into Greek and he gives it a similar translation. You're going to be a father of many nations. However, so it's an accurate way to describe it, but it's a, um, a very mild translation of a very vivid image. Um, when, when he changes his name, if you look at verse 5, he says, I'll make you a father of many nations. So father, many, and nations. Those are the three words that are now, uh, that, that are, those are the three ideas that are being included in Abraham's name. 
Now, father of, that's the same. But what used to be rum, exalted, is now um, he tacks onto that the, the ham, okay, ham. And, and, and if you look in the, um, in the Hebrew, the text, the many nations in Hebrew, it's, I'll make you a father of, of hamon. That's the word he uses there for many. And then for nations, goyim. If you've ever heard um, Jews refer to Gentiles, they refer to them as the goyim, uh, because goyim just means the nations. There's Israel, and then there's the rest of y'all, the, the goyim, the nations. And here, um, God promises Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of hamon nations. And hamon here is the word that's being translated for many. The thing is, though, if you wanted to just say many, there are lots of, there's, there's other Hebrew words that would be more obvious to choose to say that. Hamon does not just mean many. Now that's one um, accurate translation of it, but it means a whole bunch more. There's a whole bunch more to the word hamon. Um, if you were to imagine uh, for a moment, imagine a, a band of Israelite warriors who are getting ready for a big battle, okay? So you've got a bunch of warriors that are gathered together, and they're starting to get ready for battle. And so they're, um, they're lacing up their boots, they're strapping their shield on, they're banging their spear against their shield and, and lacing up their helmet, and they're starting to yell and encourage and, and whoop, and all, all of the, the things that guys would do beforehand. If you can imagine, you've seen what it looks like before guys are about to go out and play a, um, you know, like a lacrosse game or something like that. Now imagine we're about to go out um, into an actual battle. Um, imagine the kind of tumult that those guys would be raising as they get themselves in their minds and the right uh, mindset to go into the battle. And then imagine that this isn't just a band of Israelite warriors. Imagine that this is an enormous host, um, tens of thousands of Israelite warriors suiting up and about to go out to battle. And just imagine what the sound would be like, what the tumult or the din, the roar would be like as that group gets ready for battle. That sound, that sound specifically is what Hamon refers to. Okay. Hamon is the din or the tumult of an enormous troop getting ready to move out like that. And, and God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you, you a father of that kind of nation, <laughs> or those kinds of nations, because it's, a, it's plural. I'm going to make you a father of countless descendants who sound like that as they move out. Now, it's true that that means that there's going to be a lot of them. You can't have a din, you can't have a tumult, you can't have a roar if there's only six or seven of you. Uh, so it means that there's a whole lot of them. But it means something about the disposition of these men, the disposition of these nations, and what they're planning on doing. Um, at the same time, we see Sarah's name is changed from Sarai to Sarah just a little bit later, and her name is specifically being changed. Um, Sar means prince, and her name is changed to Sarah, the feminine form. She's changed to princess. She's changed to a name of a mother of people who rule, uh, who are going to go out and dominate. Um, so the promise, uh, so then to understand, I think, the, um, the significance of this image as God is speaking to Abraham and saying, this is what your descendants are going to be like. Let's consider briefly then a summary of the Abrahamic covenant. And like I said, I'm going to be jumping from Genesis 12 to 13 to 15 to 17 to 22 because they're all the same promise slowly unfolding. And let's Let's look at this promise as it unfolds and see how this is describing um, a Hamon uh, nation. First, the promise to Abraham was, um, was something that was going to be realized through Abraham's children. Okay, he says, and, and we, you never fully see this realized in Abraham. It's something that's going to descend from him. Uh, when, the, uh, when the promise first, and, but this was surprising though. This was strange. God says, I'm gonna, this is going to be something that's going to happen through your seed. And this was surprising when God gave this promise to Abraham because in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, the first two times that God speaks to him and starts to unfold this promise, Abraham had no children because his wife was barren. In fact, when we we look at Genesis 15, verses 2 through 3. God has, has told him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm uh, your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. 
So Abraham, right, at this point, his servant was going to be his, uh, the one who inherited all of his belongings. And God is promising him that you're going to have this seed that's going to inherit the whole earth. And Abram says, how can this be the case? How can this happen? I don't have any children. So God keeps promising Abraham that your children are going to receive this inheritance. Your children are going to be like this. And Abraham has no children. Um, but the promise was that Sarah would give him a son. Um, and even when Abraham's name was changed in Genesis 17, the passage that we were considering, uh, he still had had no son by Sarah. And he was hoping that the promise could be realized through Ishmael. Okay, he, he, because he'd already taken her handmaid, Hagar, and he was thinking that at least maybe Ishmael can have it. But God said, no, it's specifically going to be through Sarah. She's going to be the princess. She's going to be the queen mother uh, in this line. But God promised that this great blessing would come through Abraham's children. So the first thing we know is that this is a, a promise to Abraham's descendants. Um, the promise of God is realized by the children of Abraham, and those children are going to be miraculously supplied by God. Second, as we look through the Abrahamic covenant, we see that this was a promise of blessing. God promised, and, and as you read these passages, you'll see again and again this recurring blessing. It's going to be a blessing. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. Genesis 12, 2, blessing, I will bless you. And the same thing is again in Genesis 22, 17, blessing, I will bless you. And, and that's in Hebrew, that's a particular construction they use, the blessing, I will bless you, where you have the verb repeated like that. It's a particular construction to really emphasize something. So when God tells in Genesis 3, um, when he's telling Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of this uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. Um, and he says, uh, dying you will surely die, uh, in the Hebrew, and, and, or dying you will die. And then the English translation often will translate it, you will surely die. But it's just a way in Hebrew they really want to emphasize a point, they'll repeat the verb like that. Blessing, I will bless you. It's God's way of saying, this is going to be a very powerful and poignant blessing that I'm going to make happen to you and to your descendants after you. Um, and this blessing is going to come, first of all, as a temporal blessing, as Abraham uh, receives riches and wealth and is prospered. But ultimately, the blessing is a blessing of eternal fellowship with the Father. He, um, think of it, um, by the time we hit the New Testament, to be in Abraham's bosom, that's what everybody wants, is to be in Abraham's bosom, which means that you are walking into eternal fellowship with the Father. The ultimate blessing that God is giving Abraham is eternal fellowship with with the Father. That's what this covenant is about. Um, and the way that God was going to bless Abraham was by turning Abraham into a blessing for the world. And this is really um, very interesting. If you go back to Genesis 12, look at verse, verses 2 and 3. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. You notice how he moves just seamlessly from this idea that the blessing is going to be on Abraham, and Abraham is going to be a blessing to others. He, so God is going to bless Abraham such that Abraham blesses others. And in fact, I think you could argue that God is going to bless Abraham by making him into a blessing for others. If you look at verse 2, I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you. So Abraham's going to get blessed. I'm going to make your name great. How, how, does he, how does he make Abraham's name great so that Abraham is blessed by, like this? And you shall be a blessing. Abraham's name becomes great. Abraham becomes blessed as he becomes a blessing to the world. Um, we rejoice in Father Abraham because it's through Father Abraham that we've received the covenant promises that God gave to Abraham. Abraham is blessed because Abraham became a blessing to the world. Abraham um, believed by faith the covenant promises that God gave to him, and in his faith were blessed. So the, uh, God sends his covenant people into the world, and those that receive them, receive the, the covenant people with blessing, then receive the blessing of God's covenant. That's what he's saying in, in verse 3, I'll bless those who bless you. So as Abraham goes out under God's blessing, those that receive Abraham and bless him, and receive God's covenant people and bless them, then be begin, begin to partake in that exact same blessing. And those that reject Abraham and curse him, 
find themselves cursed as they curse Abraham. And you think through the history from Abraham to um, Isaac to Jacob to Israel in Egypt, you think about all of the, every story that happens from here on is a story of God's blessing being on this line. And when people receive them and bless them and shower gifts on them, they find themselves blessed. And when they curse him and try to um, use them and try to oppress them, they find themselves cursed and taken from, and God's people are blessed despite all their cursing. I mean, that is the story of Israel in Egypt and the Exodus. Uh, You've got God's people with God's blessing on, on them, and then the question is, how do you respond to them? Do you abuse them? Do you curse them? Do you oppress them? If so, then you'll find yourself cursed and Israel walking away enriched by it. But when you receive them and bless them, you find yourself blessed. That's how God was going to spread Abraham blessing to the world by putting Abraham into the world and making him a blessing to the world. And then those that bless Abraham find themselves blessed and partaking in that exact same blessing. And those that curse him and reject him find themselves cursed and thrown out. So the blessing promised to Abraham's descendants was that they would become blessed by God, by spreading God's blessing to the world. And then third, next um, attribute of the Abrahamic covenant that we see, um, we see that the promise went from a single seed to innumerable descendants, from a single nation to all nations, from a single land to all of the world. Genesis 17, 6, I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. God's intention was not for Israel to become one great nation, but for Israel to become a blessing that spread to all nations. It wasn't just one nation that would expand, it was a nation that would um, spread into all nations. Uh, Genesis 12, 3, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not just nations, but all the way down to the level of families. All the families of the earth are supposed to be blessed through Abraham. And then Genesis 22, 18, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, and they would become an innumerable host. Genesis 13, 16, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then you you descendants, then your descendants could also be numbered, okay? If you were to try to imagine that experiment, you kids, you can try this at home. Um, take just, just even a little teaspoon of dirt and spread it out on your kitchen table, and then just take a needle and try to start counting those little grains of dust as they come across, and see how many you can actually count. And then God here promises Abraham I will make your descendants that number only take the dust from all of the earth. That's how many will descend from you. Um, in Genesis uh, 15, 5, then he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Uh, in Genesis 22, verse 17, and he, and he said to him, <coughs> So shall your descendants be. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. Again, it's an innumerable host. It's beyond what you can count. God's intention was for a seed to descend from Abraham, and it was a seed that would come from him miraculously. It's a seed that God himself would have to supply. And then he's going to take that seed and he's going to make that seed a blessing to the entire earth, to every, every nation, every family, to every individual, so that it becomes so many people that you can't count the number. He's going to spread, spread that nation like that by becoming a blessing to the world. And that picture of Hamon, okay, that picture of the host that's ready to go out and advance and take this blessing to the world That's what he put into Abraham's name, and that's what he promised him. Excuse me. The New Testament then, uh, the authors of the New Testament reveal to us that there's even more to this promise. Look at Galatians 3, 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. This is a really interesting application that the Apostle Paul makes with the Abrahamic covenant. Notice there 
in verse 8, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. What does Paul call the Abrahamic covenant? What does Paul call this promise that's being made to Abraham? He calls it the gospel. Um, now, we're, we are so um, used to our our own versions of the gospel. We've got tracks with just a few points, and we've got a very specific set of premises, a, a very specific set of a bit of information that has to be presented in order for us to consider it a presentation of the gospel. But Paul says that when God promised Abraham, when God gave this promise to Abraham, he was preaching the gospel to him. Now, the thing, the thing is, is if you hear this, if you, if you listen to the promise to Abraham, going back to Genesis 12, if you listen to this, thinking about this, how is this like the gospel? You'd be surprised to see how much this sounds like what the gospel probably sounded like to you when you first heard the gospel. If you were a, a college student, an unbeliever, and you didn't know the Lord, and, and somebody came and started sharing the gospel with you, it wouldn't sound actually that far off from this. Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you, I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse him who curses you, and you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. Okay, here you are, uh, you've, you've, you've not known the Lord, you're in an unbelieving family, and somebody shares the gospel to you, and what are you thinking? Well, you're going to have to get up and go. You're going to have to leave behind a whole host of things that you once trusted in. You're possibly a family, possibly a nation, possibly um, false gods. Who knows what it is that you're going to have to turn your back on and walk away from so that you can, with faith, receive the promise that God has for you that he's going to bless you and give you something great. This actually is very similar to what we know of or what we've experienced with the gospel. And, and Paul says, says specifically in Galatians 4 or Galatians 3 that when Abraham received this promise this 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 particular promise in Genesis 12 that's expanded on throughout the next few chapters the same promise that's included in the change of his name from Abram to Abraham, when Abraham received that promise, he was receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same gospel that we believe in, the same gospel by which we've been saved. When Abraham got up and left his family, left his people, left his country, and went where God told him to go, that was him hearing the gospel. And when you received the gospel, you received the same blessing which he received, and you became that same blessing to the world. So not only did he receive Jesus Christ as he was believing in this promise, but as you believed in Jesus Christ, you are receiving the promises that were made to Abraham. You are receiving the, um, that, that whole imagery that I've been describing, all of the points I've been describing with the Abrahamic covenant, that has been promised to you. Paul also argues here that not only was Abraham receiving the same gospel that we received, he also says that Abraham received the gospel the same way that we received it. He makes that point here in, in Galatians 3, but he also makes it in Romans chapter 4. Let me hop over there for just a moment. Romans 4 verses 1 through 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Okay, Abraham um, did not receive the promise that he, re that he received by having obeyed. He received it by faith. And Paul says... That same faith that he had, that's the faith that's being required of you. Um, you didn't, you're not just receiving the same promises of Abraham, you're receiving them the exact same way that Abraham, you're receiving them by faith. It's part of why Abraham um, received the promises when he had no child. If he'd had a child, it would have been easy to believe in, but God wanted him to believe that this is something that's entirely of God, that's something that God provides. And so he gave him the promises with no seed so that Abraham would have to trust by faith that this was something that would happen. 
And that's the same thing that, that we've been called to. Paul points out that Abraham received this, promises, this promise not by the works of the law, but by believing it just like us. And then back in Galatians 3, verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So the blessing that Abraham has, you receive that bless, that same blessing by having faith just like uh, your father Abraham. And third then, uh, continue on in Romans 4, <clears throat> hopping to verse 16. Um, Paul argues here that not only did Abraham receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, not only did he receive it by faith the same way that we receive it, but also that we've received all the promises that were given to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. Look at verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise, okay, the, the promise that was made to Abraham might be sure to all the seed Remember, we said that this is a promise that would be um, passed on through Abraham's descendants. It was a promise to Abraham's children. And he says here, the, the promise is made by faith so that it could be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Okay, that last line um, is, is powerful. Abraham is the father of us all. Because when you are of the same faith of Abraham, when you share in the faith with Abraham, then you receive the promises of Abraham, and you are the children of Abraham. So going back to those Genesis promises, when he was describing the seed of Abraham, it's referring to you. It's referring to those who have uh, received the same promise by faith. Who is the seed of Abraham? Those who have his faith. And those who have an Abrahamic faith then have the Abrahamic promises. This means that back when we were trying um, to understand what it meant for Abraham to be promised that his descendants would be Hamon nations, uh, and we were imagining the army getting suited up for battle, when we were doing that, we were picturing ourselves, okay? When you're imagining what that, that sound would sound like, you're picturing, you're imagining in your mind the sound of us gathered to sing praises back to God, us gathered together to worship uh, the triune God. That's what, that's what that is referring to. So I believe the, the coloring sheet for today is, is a picture of the Israelite warriors getting suited up for battle. That, that, that's what you're coloring uh, if you're, if you're um, coloring as you listen along here. And you need to understand that what you're coloring is yourself. You're coloring those people who have received God's promises by faith and want to advance with his word. Um, we are the blessing to the world because we carry the gospel to the world. Um, Jesus told us, Matthew 28, 19, these were the marching orders he gave us as he left in the Great Commission. Go, make disciples of all the nations. And Jesus constantly grabs from that Abrahamic um, language when he talks about all nations, all nations, all the world. This gospel is to spread to all the world. He's just describing the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant in his gospel. Remember that Abraham's uh, blessing was a blessing that came as he encountered others. Remember in Genesis 2, or Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3, we were pointing out how Abraham was blessed by becoming a blessing to others. He was, he was blessed by running into uh, non-believers, interacting with them, and then having them respond to him, having them respond to the promises that had been made to him. And they respond either with a blessing or they respond with a curse. And if they bless him, then they partake in the blessing with him. If they curse him, then Abraham is still blessed and they're cast out. That is just what we're doing with the gospel. Okay, the God, God has passed on that covenant to us and that's being realized now in the church. And as we bump into others, as we bump into the world, the world will either be blessed by us as if they receive the gospel or they'll be cursed as they reject the gospel. Um, this, so this promise that he was to um, become a blessing to the world then is being realized in us. And that means that we are an advancing force. That, that's why we are that Hamon in Abraham. We are an advancing force. Um, Abraham was promised in Genesis twenty-two seventeen, 17, your descendants shall possess the gates of their, the gate of their enemies. He's promised that your descendants will possess the gate of their enemies. And that only happens, you only bump into the gate of your enemies when you are marching on your enemies 
enemy's strongholds. Okay, you're not, it's not often that you're in retreat running and find yourself being pursued by gates. Okay, they don't break out the gates when they're in hot pursuit after you. You bump into the gates when you are advancing and they are retreating. When you have pushed them back into their last stronghold, that's when you come into their gates. And Abraham was promised your descendants, right? Remember, your descendants, that's us, are going to possess the gates of their enemies. That means that your descendants are going to pursue their enemies all the way to the ends of the earth to conquer them. Um, and that, that only happens then when you're marching on your enemy's strongholds. When Rebecca um, left to marry Isaac, her brothers prophesied of the blessing that she was stepping into because she was stepping into this line. This is Genesis 24, verse 60. They said, our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Right, again, that promise that your seed is going to be an advancing seed. And Jesus, <coughs> knowing that his church was the seed that inherited this promise, said of the church in Matthew 16, 18, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus is constantly borrowing from this Abrahamic imagery to describe what his church is going to do. It's going to advance and possess even the gates of Hades. Hades itself is going to um, tremble before the advancing church. So then, in the week to come, Think about where God has put you on the offense. Where, where has God um, put you in a position where you are advancing with blessing for the world? Where can you advance in the week that's ahead of you? Where can you encounter the world with the blessing of Jesus Christ? And, and notice, remember, as I said before, Abraham becomes the blessing as he bumps into the world. Where are you going to be bumping into the world that you can be a blessing to the world? You are called to be a blessing to the world. Where do you have opportunities uh, to become that kind of blessing? Where is the world encountering you and having to make up its mind as whether it will respond to you with blessing or cursing? Where is the world encountering you, seeing that you have something special and having to make up their mind of whether they're going to bless that or curse it? Um, because that's what you're called to do. That's what we as a church are called to do, to continue this advance. Now, um, this is obviously obviously a little bit of a, a post-mill message. Uh, this is informed by the, the post-millennial eschatology, the idea that the gospel is going to advance until it fills the entire earth, which I think is what um, just the, the culmination of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and the, the thing that's kind of funny is if you think about it, post-millennialism has long been a very minority view. And that's, and that's just really, it, it's kind of a, a, a funny um, quirk where you've got this view uh, that the gospel is going to advance to fill the entire earth and the people that think that are very few little people. It's just, it's just a select little group of folks that believe that. I don't think that that's going to be the case for long. I think that this conviction is something that's going to be um, um, uh, you already see um, signs of this. More and more people starting, starting to come to the conclusion that the, we ought to have a, an optimism about the spread of the gospel. I think that that conviction is starting to spread. But even now, we're a little bit um, of a minority. But what happens, though, what happens when God brings this into a more tangible, more um, palpable fruition? What happens when God brings it about where more and more people are convinced by this? What happens when this is no longer the minority view? Uh, and I'm not talking about just um, in the world. I'm talking about just in the church. What happens when this is no longer the minority view in the church? But what happens when this becomes the majority view? of the church. What, what will that um, do to us? What if God brings this to fruition? Um, there is a when, when, you're, when you're just the select few, when you're just, um, there's two or three of you that believe in a particular thing, and it makes you um, kind of the outcast from the rest of Christendom, uh, that can be kind of hard. And it really, there's a particular kind of Christian discipline that allows you to be somebody who stands um, contramundum, as, as Athanasius said, against the world. There's a particular kind of gift that God gives people to make them bold when the whole world is against them, to be ready to not be terrified by the fact that the whole world is against them. You think, I think of, um, I think it's in Acts uh, 6, or no, Acts 5, when um, 
Peter and the apostles are, um, I think they've just been arrested, and then the, and the chief priest is telling them, look, you can't preach this anymore. And Peter just says, look, you, you know, you tell me, what, what do you think I should do? Should I listen to men or to God? Wh which, which should I do? Um, and, and which is his way of saying, I, I just really don't give a rip about what you say. I'm going to go out, I'm going to preach the gospel. Um, now, there's a, there's a certain kind of boldness that God can give his saints that is a real, um, it's, it's a a really rare gift, and it's a very difficult gift to make you stand against the whole world. And that's a valuable and important thing to have when everybody has fallen away from the truth. But there's a corresponding personality quirk that's not necessarily a spiritual gift, it's just a personality quirk that likes to be on the fringe. <laughs> that likes that likes to be in the weird spot. Um, there's a certain kind of personality quirk that if everybody's doing this, he will automatically do this just because it's the thing that nobody else is doing. You know, if, if everybody's buying the MP3 player, you know there's one kid in the class who will al already who will always get into eight track cassette tapes. You know, if everybody's doing this, I'm gonna do the thing that automatically makes me different because I just don't want to do what everybody else does. Um, it's a personality quirk and not necessarily a deep biblical conviction. It's just a, um, something built into you that makes you not want to be like other people and want to be um, in, a, in the smaller fringe group. And the thing is, is when something like post-millennialism, when something like post-millennialism is um, not held by the rest of the church, when just a few people are holding to it, or even just the gospel, when just a few people are holding to the gospel, um, the biblical gift of being ready to be boldly contramundum, and then the personality quirk of just not wanting to do what other people do, <laughs> those two can actually closely coincide very easily. Um, and those two people can be in the same group, and they're virtually indistinguishable. But my point is, is what happens as God brings the post-millennial hope to fruition and people start um, flooding into church and people start believing in this promise throughout Christendom, then all of a sudden those two personality quirks are going to be too radically different. They're going to be on to totally different ends of the spectrum. Because one person was saying, I'm going to go with what God tells me to do, right? You know, no, no matter what anybody else says, I'm going to do what he tells me to do. And if I'm the only person, if I'm left completely standing by myself, so be it. But if millions of people are swarming and following me, then that's wonderful as well because God is bringing this blessing to fruition. But the other person is going to embrace this truth for as long as it's the edgy weird thing. <laughs> and then as soon as it becomes mainstream, they're going to want to bust out and find something else edgy and weird so that they never can get brought into this larger, um, they don't want to be around other people, basically. And so what happens then as God um, blesses the church and brings this promise to fruition? One of the things that we're going to have to, one of the things we'll have to be prepared for is to be not the weird people, <laughs> not the people who are on the edge, not the people who are um, standing against the world in every, in every, um, in every sector, because at some point the world is going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Um, and the crucial distinction between, between these two um, men is whether we, what kind of faith you're of, right? What is it that you are believing in? What, what are you building um, your, uh, what are you building your confidence in? What are you, what is your foundation? We don't want a fringe faith. We don't want to believe in something to make us difference just so, for the sake of being ostracized from the world. We want an Abrahamic faith. Hey, we want the faith that Abraham had, a faith that is dead set on advancing against the world. Uh, we want a faith that delights to become a blessing to the world so that the world might be blessed through us. So again then, let me challenge you to think about where God is calling you to advance. Where, where is God um, give, you know, arranging circumstances such that you have been blessed and the world is seeing your blessing and having to respond to it. Uh, what opportunities has he put in front of you to be a blessing to the world in the week ahead of you? What families, what nations should the gospel be advancing to through your life? And let me just uh, read that chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, one last time, because this is, this is the gospel. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you have already blessed us beyond measure. You have called us into fellowship with yourself by the death and resurrection of your Son and by the power of your Holy Spirit. You have made our names great because you have given us the name of your Son. But Father, we ask that you would bless us even more, that you would make our names even greater, and that you would do so by blessing others through us. Help us to see this week where we ought to be more boldly proclaiming your name and your victorious gospel. And we know that this is your will because your Son taught us to pray. Who art in heaven. Amen. The charge is this. Um, have an Abrahamic faith. Find some gates and kick them in. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.